invite you to open a Bible to John chapter 15 as we continue studying what God's word teaches us about rest and this invitation that through God's grace that he gives to you and me to find rest, not just for our bodies, but for our very souls in Jesus. And so as we dive into God's word, Jesus gives us a command that many of you are probably familiar with where he tells us over and over and over again in this passage to abide in him. How many of you are familiar with this passage, right? To so many people, it's very comforting. It's very beautiful. It's okay. We're going to abide in Jesus. Now, here's the funny thing about commands in the Bible. Some of them are really good, right? Like, abide in me, right? How many of you think, oh, that's a nice promise-sounding command, right? There's other passages that we've looked at in the past few weeks where Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, right? He's telling us, come to me, right? And then there's other commands in the Bible. They're technically good, right? <laughs> but they're not fun, right? Here's an example. Jesus multiple times tells you to love your enemies. So anybody brave enough to raise your hand and say you've got an enemy? <laughs> some of you are some of you are like on the inside i'm raising all of my hands all right so right we're like oh that's a command in the bible right jesus said it and it must be good right because he's jesus and he wants good for us how many of you though hear the command from jesus to love your enemies pray for your enemies forgive your enemies all of which jesus gives us and you rejoice at those commands and go i can't wait to do them Right? Does anybody, like if I change the sermon on the spot right now and just said, hey, let's just talk about that. How many of you think you'd walk out of here going, I'm so glad I went to worship this morning where I got told to forgive people that have upset me and hurt me, right? But there's other commands that we love. Come to me, all who are weary. Oh, it's beautiful. That's for me. Abide in me. Oh, I want to be with Jesus. But here's what I've noticed about us as human beings <laughs> that the Bible reveals to us is whether the command is really hard, like forgive and love our enemies, or it sounds like a wonderful, beautiful promise, come to me and rest, abide in me, we're really good at disobeying all of them, right? And so this morning, as we dive into this, this wonderful, beautiful command and promise and invitation from Jesus to abide in him, I want to look at Three ways that you and I disobey this command, ignore this invitation. And at the end, I want to look at how you and I, by the power of God's grace, can actually be obedient and receive the goodness of it. So as we dive in, I want to begin with a story from Ezekiel chapter 17. You don't have to open your Bible there. I'm just going to summarize it. But what is happening in the book of Ezekiel is God has exiled his people to an empire called Babylon under a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And he tells the remaining king in Israel, Zedekiah, to obey Nebuchadnezzar and to make a covenant with him and be obedient to him. And God says, by doing so, you will be obedient to me. Right? So there's those stingy commands of God, right? And just like you and me, guess what Zedekiah doesn't like? Loving his enemies, <laughs> doing good for Nebuchadnezzar. And so what happens is God, through the prophet Ezekiel, tells Zedekiah, here was my plan. And he describes Zedekiah like being a vine that is planted in the ground. And he says, my plan for you was to prune you so that you would grow and be more fruitful and become more and more like my people. And the problem, though, if you read Ezekiel 17, is that Zedekiah doesn't like God's commands. He doesn't like God's plans. He doesn't like God's timing. He doesn't like how God is going about the pruning process. And so what Zedekiah ends up doing is disobeying God, and he turns instead, and he asks Egypt for help. And he says, will you send your chariots and your soldiers and come defend us and help us and rescue us? And Zedekiah's whole reasoning for it was because God's rescuing and God's plan is taking too long. And so the way he's described in Ezekiel chapter 17 as being a vine 
that uproots himself and plants himself somewhere else. And this, unfortunately, is a story that gets repeated in our lives all the time. So Jesus, in chapter 15 of John, starting verse 1, describes himself as the vine, and that we're the branches meant to be connected to him. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So he's describing us in the same way that Zedekiah is described, that, that he is the vine and that we're these branches that are meant to be rooted and grounded in him and connected to him, and that he has plans for you and I, that he would prune us, that he would mold us and shape us so that we could produce more fruit, we could become the disciples that he intends for us to be. But this leads to our first issue, just like Zedekiah, is that we uproot ourselves. Right? There's this vineyard that God has made, and Jesus is the vine. He's saying, I've planted you here. I have connected you to this vine named Jesus. And our response, like Zedekiah, is to uproot ourselves and say, I want to be planted over there. Right? So Jesus makes this wonderful invitation abide in me. And he's going to say it over and over and over again because we're dumb and he wants to get our attention, right? He's like, no, just in case you forgot, just in case you disobeyed, I want you to abide in me. But just like Zedekiah, what we do is we uproot ourselves. Now, I know what you're thinking is you want to argue with me because I can see your facial expressions, which is, no, pastor, I love Jesus, right? I want to be with Jesus. How many of you feel that way? Believe that? I, I mean, I believe you. I don't think you're lying to me, okay? <laughs> no, 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 right? Here's the tricky part. Zedekiah would have said, no, I want to be with God. I want to be where God plants me and puts me in life. I want to be obedient to God, right? We have these good desires. But Zedekiah got impatient with the way things were going. He looked at God's plan and said, that's going to take too long. How many of you have ever thought in life, things are taking too long? The rest of you are miracles and patient. This is amazing, right? Well, a lot of us probably get to the idea where it's what? This is taking too long. And there are so many things in our society that encourage us to what? Be impatient, right? Rush. Right? So there's this wonderful invention called the self-checkout line at stores. How many of you are like me and have the impulse to help somebody else out? Right? Anybody done that? It's not going to benefit them. It's not going to really speed my life up. But I can't tell you, like, the uncomfortableness in my body where I'm just like, just scan it. I'll, I'll help you. I, I will help you bag. Please move faster. Right? Because I got things to do. I got places to go. I don't have time to slow down, right? And this is what Zedekiah does with God. God has already, by the way, made a promise to Zedekiah and the people of Israel. I will bring you back home from Babylon. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. And Zedekiah looks at that plan and goes, it's going to take too long, though. I need to speed this thing up. And so what he does, he does what a lot of us do in life, is he takes matters into his own hands. And he goes to Egypt and he's asked for chariots and money and soldiers, right? And throughout the scriptures, especially the Psalms, chariots end up representing like earthly power and might and wealth. And so the idea is that Zedekiah is saying, I'm going to trust in these things rather than God's plan. Right? I'm going to take matters into my own hands, and if I have enough chariots, if I have enough men, if I have enough wealth, I'll be able to root myself in a better vineyard. I'll be able to live a better life, which probably is starting to sound a little bit more familiar for us. Right? Yeah, I want to be with Jesus, but if he could add some like fertilizer and get this growing a little bit faster, that would be great. And if he's not... If he's going to take too long, 
Guess what we do? I'm going to help them out, just like I'm going to help the people out at the self-checkout line, right? Like, we can do this faster, God. And when it doesn't happen, what do we do? Oh, I'll uproot myself. I need to get to a better vineyard where it can grow faster, and I can be in control of everything, and I can be the one making the plans and setting the direction and the timing of all things. So yeah, we'll say, oh, I wanna abide in Jesus, right? I wanna, I wanna grow at his pace for my life. I want things to go in his timing. And yet, <laughs> Just like Zedekiah, we're like, yeah, but, you know, I could get some, like, chariots and money and things over here. And I could uproot my, but I could trust myself. I could take matters in my own hands. And I could grow faster. So that's the first way. The second way that we reject this wonderful promise of Jesus is that we reject the pruning process. So I can't grow stuff. This year, I grew peppers, and I made salsa with it. Here's why that happened. My wife planted and grew the peppers, and I took credit for it. That's, that's what happened. All right. All right. Now, um, here's the thing with the peppers, is that if you leave them on the plant too long, they would go bad. They wouldn't be fresh anymore. They wouldn't taste. They would get ginormous, but they would be disgusting. Right? So the process is that every day I have to go out and get banana peppers and jalapeno peppers and, and, and take them off the plant so that more and more could grow. Right? This is like basic gardening. So if you've ever gardened or planted vegetables or anything, like you know this, that like if I don't take the fruit off, it's going to spoil, it's going to rot, and what? It's not going to produce as much as it could. And that all sounds great, doesn't it? Because Jesus makes this promise, he's like, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither could you unless you abide in me. Right? He's telling us, like, look, you're, you're not going to produce fruit, you're not going to mature in your faith, you're not going to grow a life unless what? I'm connected to Jesus, right? I abide in him. And here's the deal. There's sometimes we read Bible passages that you're familiar with, that you know, and we go, absolutely, totally makes sense, right? How many of you have ever grown vegetables? Show of hand, right? Or at least you tried and you killed them, okay? All right? So like, we all know exactly what Jesus is talking about, right? It makes total sense. Until you're the plant being pruned, right? <laughs> so, so he comes along and says, hey, I want you to produce more fruit. So I'm going to prune you. And our reaction is not always praise the Lord. And in fact, this is Zedekiah's struggle way back in Ezekiel. God told him and the people of Israel, this is why I'm doing this. I'm disciplining you. I'm pruning you so that you'll be able to give more glory to my name. And they said, no, <laughs> that's a terrible plan, Lord. I've got a better plan. Right, so pruning sounds great, doesn't it? My plant's gonna grow better. It's gonna produce more peppers, more vegetables, whatever, right? Pruning sounds great, right? Jesus said it's right here, it makes totally sense. And you're in church. So you know the expected answer is what? Praise the Lord when he prunes my life, right? When he prunes my heart, when he tops off things so things can be grow better, right? That's the expected answer. Earlier, I talked about how there's commands and things in the Bible that we go, yeah, that makes sense. I know Jesus wants that, but I don't like it, right? Nobody actually enjoys the pruning process. And that's our struggle. And so in fact, what we tend to do is we tend to reject it outright. All right, so one of my favorite movies of all time is The Lion King. I don't know if you've seen it. And I mean like the animated one from the 90s. All right, I don't watch these remake stuff. I'm too old for that, all right. So one of my favorite scenes 
in The Lion King is when Simba is sitting there with his dad and they're looking over the whole kingdom, right? And he says to his son, everywhere the light touches what? Belongs to us. This is our kingdom. And then Simba, of course, goes, well, what about that dark shadowy area over there? And his dad says, oh, no, we don't, we don't go over there. That's not ours. That's how you and I reject God's pruning process, right? Because you go, I love the Lord, right? I'm assuming, yes. You love the Lord. You love Jesus. You want to be obedient to him. I want to abide with Jesus, right? So what we tell Jesus is, everything that the light touches is yours. And then Jesus comes along with his pruning shears. He's like, well, what about this? Like, oh, no, you don't get to go over there. Anybody ever done that? Like, no, no, I'll, I'll confess this sin. I'll, change, I'll work on this bad habit, right? I'll, I'll admit that this thing right here is an idol. And then Jesus comes along. He's like, well, I want to prune you so you can grow more fruit. And I'm like, yeah, right here. I give you permission, Lord, <laughs> to touch every area over here of my life. I, I give you permission to come over here and, and prune every area over here in my life. And then Jesus keeps going, well, what about this spot? And you know what I do and you do? And that's, that's just for me. I'm not going to give that one up. Uh, that's too painful. That's too hard. So one of the things that we do is, oh, there's this wonderful invitation. Abide in me. And Jesus is promising the whole time, if you abide in me, you're going to produce fruit. You're going to have this abundant life. And he goes, yeah, but here's what it requires. There's a pruning process. And a lot of times we reject the pruning process. because I'm not going to confess that sin. I'm not going to let go of that idol. Here's why, by the way, you and I don't let go of our idols. Even though we know, like, oh, it's bad. Idolatry is wrong. It's because we love them. We love our idols. We love whatever pleasure or, or feelings it gives to us. And we believe the lie that says this, being rooted in this, being connected to this, is what's going to give me life, fulfill me. And so when Jesus comes along, he's like, we gotta, we got to cut that out. Oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you can cut all this other stuff off because I don't really like it as much. But this one's my favorite, so you can't have it. So the third way that we reject this invitation to simply abide in Jesus is we chase perfectionism, especially as Christians. So as a pastor, I've heard so many times, I want to be a better Christian. Anybody ever thought that? Some of you are like, no, nah, I've given up way a long time ago. All right. <laughs> but some of us, we think to ourselves, what? I'd like to be a better Christian. Be a little more like Jesus. Be cruel. Right? And if you're like, oh, I'm not sure where I am in faith. We're like, okay, I'd like to be a better person. So you know what we do then? We set goals, right? We say, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to stop doing these things. And then... What? I'll be perfect. I'll be improved. I will be better. How many of you have realized the lie at that tells you leads to just being exhausted all the time, right? Because how many of you have actually gotten to be perfect yet? How many of you are close? Anybody? <laughs> that was a good, that's a good argument starter. <laughs> all right. Well, we think, what, we, we would say it all the time, right? Well, nobody's perfect, right? That's our get out of jail free card. Like, ah, oh, I've messed up, I've sinned. Well, no, no, it's perfect. But at the flip side of it, what are we always trying to do? Strive for it, right? Beat ourselves up, burden ourselves, or we burden other people to always be improving, always getting better. One of the interesting things about this passage is that Jesus doesn't talk about perfection. What he's talking about is progress or growth or simply maturing. Right? And so he goes on and he says it this way. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. Right? But if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So this whole time, Jesus is never saying, like, I want you to become a finished plant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and then you're done. You, right? The whole time, he's talking about what? Bearing fruit, growing more fruit. And in fact, he even says part of the process that the father does in this pruning, right? Part of it is like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. He cuts off the dead branches, right? So if you ever tried to take care of plants or trees, what do you do to make them healthier? You get rid of the dead stuff, more life can grow. We go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But one of the things that he also says is that he takes the plants he takes the branches that are already producing fruit, right? Already doing good. And he does what to them as well? He prunes those as well. Right? You're like, what are you doing? Like, I'm doing good, Lord. And the whole reason is why? Because then they can produce what? Even more fruit. They can keep growing in a healthy way. They can keep maturing. They can keep glorifying God. So the whole process is not about you and I saying, I've got to be perfect for Jesus. That's a crushing weight to put on ourselves. Right? It, well, we know it is. As many lists as you and I can come up and say, this is how I want to get better as a human being. This is how I want to get better as a disciple of Jesus. When we start aiming for perfection, saying like, oh, this is what he demands of me, it just crushes us, right? You know, like, how many of you, if I told you, like, hey, just go out and be perfect this week, make me proud, as your pastor, would be like, I give up now, right? <laughs> like, you wouldn't even get to the door. You're just like, no, I'm not going to do it. What I love is Jesus is saying, like, no, here's, here's the process, is that you dwell in me, you abide in me, and the Father is going to continually mold you and shape you and grow you. It's about progress, not perfection. So here comes the question of like, okay, great. We've identified lots of ways we mess up. Isn't that fun? You're welcome. All right. And how many times we come up short? So how do we actually obey Jesus here? So the Greek word for abide is meno, M-E-N-O. And it can be abide, remain, but what it literally means, we just don't translate this way, is to reside or stay home. So what Jesus is telling us as his people is, here's where I want you to live. Here's where I want you to make your home, right? We even have an expression, I'm putting down roots, right? What is Jesus saying? I want you to put your roots here. So I want you to just don't keep uprooting yourself and going over here and over there. I want you to reside in my love, right? I love that, that at the end he says, as the Father has me, so have I loved you. By the way, the way the Father loves Jesus is with a perfect, unending love. And he's saying, and that's how I love you. As much as some of you are like, I got a lot of branches that need pruning. <laughs> some of us are like, I haven't produced fruit in decades Jesus goes, but here's how much I still love you, with a perfect, unending love, just like the Father loves you, loves me. And then he tells us, here's the command, abide in my love. That's it. Right? We're like, what's the secret to becoming more like Jesus? Right? How do I become a better Christian? How do I become a better human? All these pressures that we put on ourselves, all these goals that we set, and Jesus is saying, here's how you do it. You don't like uproot yourself and say, I'm going to plant myself into doing this and doing that. And he says, no, what I want you to do is I want you to take up residence. I want you to build your home in my love and just live here. And in fact, later on in the scriptures, in Galatians 5, the apostle Paul is going to have something called the fruit of the spirit. 
right? Which a lot of Christians misuse and turn it into a list of habits you got to develop, right? Like peace, kindness, gentleness, love, faithfulness, all these wonderful things, joy, right? You're like, oh, I want more of those in my life, right? How many of you would like more love in your relationships? More kindness in your friendships or at work, right? More peace between family members or in-laws or bosses, right? All of these things would be wonderful, right? These are all things we go, I'd like to get better at these. I'd like to have more of it in my life, right? What we tend to do is, well, I better get to work. I'm going to start working harder on it. And what Paul calls it is, it's the fruit of the Spirit, and in Ephesians and Colossians, and Paul's talking about us maturing in our faith, he says, you do it by being rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. And when Jesus is telling us, how do I bear more fruit? How do I become more like him? He says, oh, it's simple. You just abide in my love. So the secret to that life you and I want, where there's more peace and joy and kindness and gentleness, where there's a better world, where I'm a better Christian and more like Jesus is... Jesus, right? <laughs> You're like, oh, it's the answer I've always been told. <laughs> yeah, and you know why? Because it's a really good one, right? And Jesus is saying, here's how I want you to grow and bear fruit. Here's how you're going to become what I want you to be. You abide in my love. And of course, how do we know what his love looks like? It's the cross, right? He says, here's how much I love you. Every time you got a dead branch, Every time you come up short, you didn't produce the fruit you desired to or you should have. He says, I love you and I forgive you. And so the foundation for our whole lives as Christians of how we become more like Jesus, how we live our faith out in the day-to-day -day rhythms of life is residing in his love, constantly reminding ourselves and turning back to who he is and what he has done for us on the cross by saying, here's my perfect love for you. You are forgiven, you are loved, you are redeemed. And then here's his big command for you and me. Abide in that. Rest in that knowing, okay, it's not about me being perfect. It's not me about hitting a certain quota of fruit and production. It's simply me going, Jesus loves me and I believe it. Let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. That as your disciples, we would abide in your love and grace each and every single day, being reminded of your perfect love for us, and that we will bear much fruit by inviting others to rest in your grace and to live in your mercy. In your name we pray. Amen.